Ah, the Vikings, my favorite Scandinavian raiders who crossed the ocean, they came, they saw, they raided. But when did the Viking Age actually begin? Well, that's easy. Let's go to Wikipedia and find out. Right, so Wikipedia Viking Age 793. What does Wikipedia.nl say? Hmm, okay, between the years of 789. That's sort of the same, but kind of different. Right, Danish Wikipedia will know. If there's anyone that will know, it'll be Danish. Ah, so that one's saying 700. That's quite a bit earlier. So in this video, I'm going to answer the question of when does the Viking Age begin, or at least to provide an answer. So when it comes to the Viking Age, we really need to think about what we mean and why it might be the case that in Denmark, in England and in the Netherlands, different dates are given for when this Viking Age actually started. Now, of course, the most important bit in the name the Viking Age is this word Viking, and there's been an awful lot of discussion about what we mean by it. Now, a lot of people point to the fact that it comes back to the old Norse word vikinger. Well, actually, before we get this old Norse word vikinger recorded, we get weeching from Old English, which means something like raider or pirate. And basically, how we interpret this word viking will very much dictate how we interpret the Viking Age, as the Viking Age is the age of Vikings, whoever they happen to be. Now, the classic image of the Vikings is of these raiders coming from Scandinavia, getting in long ships, sailing to another shore, burning down a monastery or a town, taking plunder with them, and then going back. But at the same time, and a lot of this has been recently very important for study of the Viking Age is that most Scandinavians during the period didn't actually go into ships and go and plunder other areas, as well as many others pointing to the fact that the word vikinger is rather more like an occupation. People would go on Viking during one season and then come back and be traders or farmers or craftsmen for the rest of the year. And these are also an important element of this Viking Age. So in some broader definitions of Viking, all of the above would be part of a Viking culture, let's say. And in fact, in common modern English usage, that is how Viking is used. So if a Norse coin is dug up, a lot of the time it will be described as a Viking coin, or you might have a Viking farmer. Whereas especially in YouTube comment sections and in some more modern uses of the word Viking, people are going back to an older meaning of the word, which is just this idea of having raiders, seaborne raiders, rather than them being everyone of that culture at that particular time. Although this too is actually going back to an older form of the word, which might be a little bit redundant when we're talking about it, because actually the Viking Age doesn't just look at those raiders and their activity, because due to these raids and expansions, we get a lot more that's going on that is quintessential to the Viking Age. So raiding is one component of that. But thanks to raiding, we also see centralization of power. Raiding is, of course, on a spectrum with trading, and many of the raided goods would eventually be traded, sometimes all the way back to the place they had originally been raided from. Raiding also meant that they came into contact with new religions and that conversion went on and also that an injection of wealth led to more urbanization as well as the protection for certain urban areas against raiders led to more centralization of power which also attracted missionaries that came and converted them. At the same time, raiding and seaborne technology advancing led to much more exploration as well as migration in the long run. So you can see that all of these things are linked back to Vikings and to raiding. And so all of them are important elements of the Viking Age. And ultimately, these are all things that we should bear in mind because they will be incredibly important for deciding how we define the Viking Age and therefore also how we determine when the Viking Age started and if we can give a specific date for that or not. Now, traditionally, if you ask someone, especially in England, but also I think in other countries of the world, when did the Viking Age start? can you give me a permanent date? That date would be 793 AD. And the reason for this is that this was the date of the famous Viking attack on Lindisfarne. This is on Holy Island, an island off the coast of Northumberland, today in the northeast of England, at that time part of the Kingdom of Northumbria. And as we can read in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, this is your classic Viking attack. 
Scandinavian men in boats. They arrive on this little island, they jump off, they go and find the monks with their church, they kill a lot of the monks, they take others away, they burn the church, and they take the treasure. Absolutely classic Viking stuff. We know 793, boom, it's definitely started. Actually, we can read about this in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. We read, here were dreadful forewarnings come over the land of Northumbria and woefully terrified the people. These were amazing sheets of lightning and whirlwinds and fiery dragons were seen flying in the sky. A great famine soon followed these signs and shortly after in the same year on the sixth day before the Ides of January, should be July, the woeful inroads of heathen men destroyed God's church in Lindisfarne's island by fierce robbery and slaughter. So that's your classic Viking attack. But how do we know that it's the first one? Because this is simply the first one that we find recorded in any of our written sources. Or is it? Because if you go back in the same text in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and you read under the year 787, which should actually be the year 789 because of a date calculation error, then we find that in Portland, which at that time was an island off the south coast of Dorset in the south of England, that we read another very interesting account. Here, Beortric took King Offa's daughter Eadbur. And in his days came first three ships from Hordaland, and then the Reeve rode there and wanted to compel them to go to the king's town because he did not know who they were, and then they killed him. These were the first ships of the Danish men which sought out the land of the English race. This is incredibly interesting because Hordaland, as we now know, is an area in Norway. And the fact that they are coming from Scandinavia in ships and that they are indeed described as the first Danish men, Dane just being a term that was applied to pretty much all Scandinavians at this point by English writers, does indicate that this actually is a raiding expedition that has happened, and that when the Reeve, who is basically in charge of making sure that all trade is happening in the king's towns so that there's no trade going on without paying tariff and taxation, that kind of thing, when he is killed, this clearly also suggests they're not peaceful Scandinavians, but they're coming over for plunder and they're coming over with violence in mind. So should we then set the date back a few years to 789? And we have another interesting source which was recorded in 792, but which talks about documents and problems that had been had several decades before from the Synod of Cloveso. And this mentions that provisions were given to a church that they would not have to pay certain forms of taxation because they were dealing with marauding heathen in roving ships. And this certainly, once again, sounds like our classic Viking activity going on further south in England. So perhaps we do need to reimagine if we really do have a solid, clearly definable starting date for the Viking Age, even in England, because normally it's, boom, 793 to 1066. But can we really say this is the case when we have these other sources pointing towards real Viking activity going on here before this date? However, one of the biggest challenges for Viking raiding expeditions in England was when it came to connecting to the local Wi-Fi networks. Because as we all know, when you're out and about and abroad, it can be quite risky to connect to just any old random server that you find. Well, the Vikings unfortunately lived in a time when they didn't have access to today's video sponsor, which is NordVPN. But luckily, if we encounter some of those same problems that the Vikings encountered, then we can use NordVPN to be safer and more connected at the same time. With NordVPN, you have access to over 5,000 servers in 60 different countries, and it's available on Windows, Android, iOS, macOS, and Linux. It's the fastest VPN that is out there compared with all the others, and using it you can get access to your favorite TV shows, movies, and games, not only when you're abroad, but also from different countries abroad if you're interested in spicing up your internet browsing. The great thing is that if you go to nordvpn.com slash Hilbert and use the code Hilbert, then you can get today's special offer to get a two year plan with four additional months at a huge discount. It's like raiding a monastery, except so much easier. There are no monks that get in the way at NordVPN. So with NordVPN, be mobile, be safe, and be connected. So now we've talked about the Viking Age in England, the beginnings and their problems connecting to the local internet. But how about in other places? Because the Viking Age touched many, many different countries and areas, indeed continents, that were hitherto unexplored or had not been put together. And so 
how is it in another place which the Viking Age touched? Well, I'd like to look at the Netherlands, not just because I'm biased, but also because this is my field of interest, the Viking Age in what was then Frisia, what is today called the Netherlands, parts of Germany, a little bit of Denmark. And we need to go all the way back to 719, because this is the year in which the famous Frisian king Redbart dies. He kicks the bucket, and after this he had resisted the Franks for many years, fighting against them, indeed being the only person ever to have defeated Charles Martel in battle at the Battle of Cologne. But upon his death, the Franks completely encroach on Frisia, and before long they have really squeezed them past. And by 785, all of Frisia that is outside of North Frisia, those islands in the mainland of Schleswig-Holstein, had fallen to the Franks. The Saxons were next and they fought several wars against Frankish encroachment until 804 when they were finally subdued by the Franks. And this is some important backstory because at this point the Frankish Empire, this large Christian expansive entity, had its border right the way up by the Elbe. That's the river there. And to the north of this area, there's a little bit of a, a marshy land there, no man's land. But really, if you push north, you end up in Denmark, which at that time was a centralizing kingdom with somewhat of a king that ruled the region of today, Denmark. Although exactly where the borders of his empire or his kingdom were is not entirely clear. And this leads to, in 810, after a lot of tension between this new Frankish state and the Danish king, full-blown war between Denmark and this Frankish empire. And King Godfried attacks Frisia. Now, it's clear to see why he does this, because Frisia has just been conquered by the Franks. He fights three battles against the Frisians, as we read in the Vita Caroli. And then he exacts a tribute from the Frisians and continues to fight against Charlemagne, who at that point was the Frankish emperor. Now, we might question whether is this really part of the Viking Age, if we take this really strict definition of Viking as being raiders who are sometimes raiders and then they go back and they can be farmers and traders. The reason being that this is a king of Denmark and that this attack on Frisia isn't like the raid on Lindisfarne which is just men coming in a boat plundering and then sailing away but rather this has a clear political goal in mind because Frisia has just been taken by the Franks and so the Danes are wanting to weaken the Frankish Empire perhaps even to wrest control over Frisia because in the Vita Caroli, it mentions that the Danish king Godfred saw Frisia as being part of his sphere of influence, and so he might have been trying to conquer this land. So whether we can really see this as a Viking raid in the very strict definition of Viking that some people now espouse, it's not exactly clear. And it's also important to note that if we do take Viking in that strict sense, then we don't actually see the, the, exactly the same kind of small-scale raiding continuing, but there is a big evolution during the Viking Age. However, in Frisia, the Viking Age doesn't start with sporadic small-scale raiding, but it starts with a huge Danish war fleet sailing in, burning the place and fighting its armies in an attempt to subjugate the region and attack the Franks, who they feel threatened by. While the Viking Age started with small-scale raids emanating from Scandinavia, it wouldn't stay that way for long. The attacks increased in size, sophistication, and scope as the 9th and 10th centuries wore on, until places as diverse as Russia, England, and Iceland were being settled by the Norse. The Kingdom of England was frequently the target of Viking attacks, and in 1016 the Dane Canute became its king after defeating Anglo-Saxon Athelred the Unready and his son Edmund Ironside. This soon brought England into the largest empire it had been in since the departure of the Romans, Canute's North Sea Empire, which incorporated Denmark and Norway as well as claiming the loyalty of the Anglo-Saxons and some of the neighboring Celtic people. While this Anglo-Scandinavian empire fell apart following Canute's death in 1035, it's fun to speculate how different history might have been had it stuck around a little longer. You can find out more about this alternate history over on my channel. Now, back to the video. And a big thank you to Mr. Z for collabing on this video and definitely check out his on the Nazi Empire and what would have happened if that had stuck around longer. So what about Denmark then? Well, 
in Denmark, they don't really view the Viking Age as being a separate entity. And in fact, they take that as being part of the long Iron Age of Scandinavia, which is then split into different parts itself. And in fact, we do find evidence for a Viking-like activity with armies getting onto ships and then rowing to a place to fight another army and then rowing back and taking tribute and, and plunder and that kind of thing. As early as the 3rd century AD, when we get these amazing discoveries of ships and of whole armies being interred into bogs as offerings. But this is largely within Scandinavia, even though we do find some evidence that there were Germanic armies from Germany and from some Slavic places coming up into Scandinavia as well. We wouldn't really recognize this as being the Viking Age, the kind of classic Drakkar ships crossing the oceans to go and raid in a foreign land. But at what point between this early period when you have these armies traveling around Scandinavia by boat with these large boat hauls and uh, they were obviously rowing, they didn't yet have sails, but obviously at some point between that 3rd century date and between let's say that the 780s when we start to get those accounts over in England that there are Scandinavians in boats coming to get them. At what point in between these two pillars can we say that the Viking Age has started? Because ultimately the seeds of the Viking Age are already in this early Iron Age Scandinavian martial maritime culture. But is there any evidence to sort of pinpoint that a little bit closer? Well, one answer that has been given is from the study of combs. And combs were very important to the Vikings. A lot of the time they were incredibly interested and invested in how they looked. And a lot of the time when you know that there are Scandinavians around, you find a lot of things like tweezers and combs and other things to ensure that you're looking your best. But combs are incredibly interesting in this way because these are combs that are made from reindeer antler. And actually some of the earliest ones that have been found in Denmark are from 725 AD at a trading site called Ribe, which is in the very south of Jutland. Now what's interesting is that these are obviously made from reindeer antler and reindeer, if you're not aware, actually aren't found in Denmark at all. But you have to get up into the center and the north of Norway to hunt reindeer and so to get reindeer antler. So the fact that already in the first quarter of the 8th century we're finding reindeer antler combs in Ribe suggests that there is a lot of maritime traffic and indeed sophisticated trade lanes with the north in the very south of Denmark. The Danish archaeologist Søren Simbach certainly thinks that this is a crucial discovery for understanding when we might say that the Viking Age in its broader sense has begun. He says the Viking Age becomes a phenomenon in Western Europe because the Vikings learned to use maritime mobility to their advantage. They learned to master sailing to such an extent that they get to the coast of England where the locals don't expect anything. They come quickly, plunder the unprepared victims and leave again, a sort of hit and run. He continues to say, we can see for the first time why they started to invest in ships and develop the technology. It's interesting that when we have two such significant developments and changes, urbanization and raids across open water, we can then say that they were in fact connected. His point being that to actually develop the technology to raid places like England to cross the open ocean, they actually had to first sit and figure it out. And but one of the ways of doing this was by trading and these short range trading routes between Norway, so sailing from the coast of Norway and then south into Denmark because travel through actually walking through the land in Norway was incredibly difficult with all the mountains and fjords. It then forced them to develop maritime technology, which at a certain point could then also be developed that they could then cross the sea and go raiding. It's unfortunate that we don't have much of a written record in Scandinavia itself outside of runestones and on those we don't really get much information from the 8th century about what they were up to. But this is indeed a very interesting development in Scandinavia that we can then say by this time they had the capability of crossing the sea, of actually getting and also in thinking in terms of more than just their valley or their mountain range, but actually thinking across the sea and trading with people from afar, as well as the rise of urbanization in places like Ribe, because if you're living in Norway, you have to have heard of Ribe to then go out and catch a reindeer to then go and trade it there. So finally, what can we conclude about the start of the Viking Age in the West and why it was different? Because of course, we have raiders coming from 
Norway, those first raiders that attacked Lindisfarne, the Hordaland, which is mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, is in Norway. And why then is Denmark the one that starts in the Viking Age as being ruled by a king that then goes and has this power struggle with the Franks? Well, there are a few reasons for this. Let's first take a look at Denmark, and a lot of this has to come down to geography, because Denmark is, compared to Norway, a lot more flat as a land, there's a lot more space there for people to actually live, and indeed the farmland is better too. And this means that one can centralize much quicker in Denmark because these polities come into contact a lot more easily. There is more farmland going around and this also means that the population is larger. And so you get kingdoms earlier on and larger kingdoms because there are fewer natural defenses there. So it means that warfare is inevitable, but also that it is decided more quickly. Now, that is why we have in Denmark that there were kings ruling fairly early on. And although a lot of people tend to think of Harald Bluetooth as the first king of Denmark, we do already have rulers that seem to be ruling very large areas of what we now see as Denmark today. An important part of where the Viking raiders from Denmark came from is that those who would lose out in power struggles, which were very frequent in Denmark, would then go and raid to try and create funds, to try and get men, to train men, and then to come back, or simply to go and to live somewhere else if their family had been ousted from power in Denmark. Also, the Danish kings who were ruling, they wouldn't want to have all these armed men at home because if the wind changed, then they could be the one being removed from power. And so having raiders going and raiding Frankish lands, for example, was a good way for the king both to gain wealth himself and to keep busy those other young armed men who might otherwise turn on him. And as I explained in my video series on the Viking Age in the Netherlands, which I will soon be making a third part for, a lot of the Danes that came to Frisia were actually members of the Danish royal family that had been ruling in Denmark and had then been kicked out by other powerful lords who became kings themselves. And so a lot of those Vikings that actually ended up being expelled from Denmark would be taken in by the Frankish emperor to safeguard part of the Frisian coastline. And so that is an enormous part of the Viking Age in the Netherlands. And that's why in the Netherlands, if you look at the Dutch Wikipedia page, they give the date of around 800 for when the Viking Age starts, because that is their experience with the Viking Age. If we now take a look at Norway, we have to immediately factor in the difference in geography because Norway, there is far less habitable areas, especially around the coast where you do have some farmable land, but really these are hemmed in between a lot of mountain ranges, between lots of forests, and indeed they are around the fjords. And so Norway, perhaps more than Denmark, is already more outward looking because they need to connect to the sea, indeed to trade with other places in Norway and power centers. If they want to expand out of their fjord, they need to have a strong navy so that they can do that. And indeed most people, traders, if they want let's say goods that they can't get in Norway, they will have to sail over most likely to Denmark to places like Riva to be able to buy them and to trade their own goods such as reindeer antler. And of course for this, it means there's a lot of sailing going on. When you're doing a lot of something, you're more likely to get technological developments that continue. And a lot of the early history of Norway in the Iron Age, you have many of these petty kingdoms based around the fjords that are frequently fighting with one another. And now if you lose out in one of these, just like in Denmark, a lot of these Norwegian petty kings would become sea kings. So basically they would patrol these sea lanes and they would prey on the traders that were going between Norway and Denmark selling their wares. While others, if they were in control, would be trying to stop these raiders from preying on the traders because if there was trade coming, that meant that these kings Kings were becoming wealthy themselves. And this is why I believe that Norway is the nucleus of in the West where we get these Viking raids from because there was a lot more competition for farmable land. There was a lot more population pressure because of the lack of habitable land for people there as compared to Denmark and that they were then the first ones to go out and raid when, for example, ports in Frisia or in Saxony that perhaps before they had been able to go to and trade with had been closed off to them by the Franks. Although it's the Danes that are more active in that area for geographic reasons, but also because of the threat that the Frankish Empire posed to Denmark. And indeed, they did several times invade Denmark themselves. 
So what do you think? When do you think that the Viking Age started? Can we say hard and fast 793 AD, boom, the day before, not the Viking Age, day after Viking Age? Or should we perhaps shift that date back a little bit earlier and put in a circa and then something like 750 AD when we know that there were Norwegians sailing down to Denmark, perhaps even sailing over to England as we read in the Synod of Cloveso and marauding heathen men. Or perhaps there were actually more raids in places where they weren't writing things down. And in fact, we do know that there were these raids and they were in Eastern Europe. But that I'm going to talk about in my next video on this little series about the dating of the Viking Age when I talk about the Viking Age in the East, because that is a very interesting topic. A lot of people are incredibly interested in the Rus and in the Vikings who went to the East, so I'll be happy to look at that in the next video. In the meantime, do let me know if you enjoyed this video in the comments below. When do you think that we should date the Viking Age? Do you think we should do it country by country for when is significant and important for that country? Or should there be a sort of, let's say, global Viking Age date? Do you think we should shift it back to around 750 because we simply don't know? Or is 793 such a classic date, such a definite starting point that nothing could ever be the same again? Let me know in the comments below, check out Mr. Z's awesome video on the North Sea Empire and have a great weekend. I've been Hilbert and this has been The History.